revered and feared. The Volvo Ocean Race is the ultimate fully crewed challenge in offshore sailing. A 37,000 mile lap of the world by its greatest sailing talent. Three weeks on from the leg one start in Alicante, the fleet has arrived in Cape Town. Records and boats shattered en route. Torben Grail's crew on Ericsson 4 become the first men ever to sail more than 600 miles in a monohull in 24 hours. Just got a 24 hour record! The pre-race favourite, Ericsson 4, tops the leaderboard after reaching Cape Town half a day ahead of its nearest challenger. Imperious on the water and idolised off it. You are looking at the fastest crew in the world. Sister boat Ericsson 3 finishes third but with a non-compliant keel. The Nordic crew loses two points as punishment but regains its self-belief. We got the moral victory. I don't really care about uh, points and all that sort of rubbish. It's what you do on the water that counts. Ericsson 4's biggest rivals are Ken Reed's crew on the red boat Puma's Il Mostro, second into Cape Town and sworn to revenge. Don't tell any of these guys with red shirts that we can't win the race right now because I don't think any of them believe it. Il Mostro's crew hints at speed in reserve and weathers the Atlantic storms well. But the rest of the fleet does not escape so lightly. Ian Walker's Green Dragon leads at the halfway stage, only to limp home in fourth following a collision with a submerged object and collateral damage to confidence and crew. That's two engine helmsmen in one hour. Both Telefonica boats struggle sailing downwind and are beset with rudder problems. Bauer Becking's boat finishes fifth despite a 12-hour stop in Gibraltar, but Fernando Ecavari's crew loses a rudder, a bowsprit, and half a dagger board on the night Ericsson 4 sets its record and finishes last. The boat used to be about eight feet longer. <laughs> No budget last minute entry, Delta Lloyd crosses the line one place above them to a rousing reception. But theirs proves to be an eventful stopover. Priorities now are rest, recuperation and repair. The leg to restart, barely a week away. Cape Town has been the most frequently used stopover since the race began in 1973. Back then, 17 boats sailed into Table Bay from Southampton at the end of the first leg. They're largely amateur crews taking on the task of repairing and restocking the boats themselves. More recently, professional shore crews have assumed that role. But where they once had over 30 days to prepare the boats, the new race schedule allows for just 12. The man waiting anxiously to assess the damage when Telefonica Black arrives is shore crew manager Campbell Field. We were missing some big bits of hardware off the bow um, that they lost in their, in their wipeout up there. Um, but we knew, we knew that. We've got all the spares here, we're ready to go on it. It's just really going through everything else. First of all, the disturbances and the fucking robbers. That's your turn. The damage stems from a suspected collision, which snaps a rudder, causing the boat to broach and ripping away the bowsprit. One of those things, emergency steering, you hope you never have to use it, and when they do use it, you hope it works. At least I don't have to worry about knocking the bow spread off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know how well the emergency steering goes backwards though, Alex. Yeah. Well, it seems alright so far. Right. Oh, you see there's our crane for tomorrow morning, ready to go. So at least we've got a crane. Hopefully there'll be a crane driver. 
know, everybody's got a massive job list. I don't think our job list is necessary any longer than anyone else's. It's, you know, just we've got slightly bigger items. I mean, the bowsprit, it's only one extra line on the job list. <laughs> Tumble. Race medical coordinator uh, yeah, Polly Goff's concern when the, Green Dragon arrived is for the soft uh, tissue of the like crew that. rather than the we structure of the hand. boat. <laughs> Both have taken a heavy <laughs> toll. I uh, have not taken any photos and there yeah. is a big wave. Yeah. They hit, you know, the ball hit the wave and it's gonna stop and I flap. And I just said, go, I said, go, get out of there. And just as I said it, we went straight down the mine. And he came washed back and he just nose butted the winch. I think it's okay. Oh, that's right. I should take a photo. So this time I asked, oh, you're bleeding. You come out. So there's a lot of blood coming from yeah. yeah. So I bleed for two days. I, oh, I don't yeah. know how Gore is still alive. He was in the companion way, sort of sitting on the step, yeah. and we nosedived, and he did... Neil was in his bunk half awake, and Neil was looking, and he said he just saw this rag doll go through the air. And he did, like, two somersaults, and then where the mast is in the galley, there's, like, this sort of area which we use as the bin, and he ended up head first with his legs in, <laughs> in the bin, having done, like, a double backflip. And he did manage flip. to get himself a photograph of... <laughs> Andrew had to pull him out legs first, pulled him out legs first. And he was fine, and, gets, and he was like, my camera, my camera, my camera. <laughs> Green Dragon's last four days have resulted in two ripped sails, damage to the pulpit, and a series of injuries to the boat's helmsman, including the skipper. They were rearranging the A3, and I totally buried it, and they all landed on me against the wheel. The wheel was bent, like, there was just been the bend in the wheel. That's two engine helmsmen in one hour. This is a stupid game. Most serious of all is their collision with something big enough to bring boats and crew almost to a standstill. I thought the rig had come down. I, I was a crunching noise and then the boat really slowed down and I, to me, I thought the rig's gone. I personally put a survival suit on, put a life jacket on, encouraged everybody else down below to do the same. And uh, I went to send a message to the duty officer that we'd hit something. But we couldn't see any damage, so we did like three or four hours and then it was quite hard even to see, but through the endoscope we could see the front of the keel was damaged. You know, it does speak volumes for the rule. You know, these boats are designed to the Volvo 70 rule, and the Volvo 70 rule does have grounding and impact load, so that if you do hit things, there's a reason for it. You know, We've obviously had a pretty big impact, and we've sailed back to Cape Town, and we're all telling the tale, so that's, something's been done right. Ericsson 3 has also got its act together. After its keel was ruled non-compliant by an international jury in Alicante, the Nordic boat has so far been penalised a total of four points, placing it sixth on the leaderboard instead of fifth. Swift work by their partners has put the boat back on equal terms. There's nothing magic to what you see behind us, it's just a, a, another keel, uh, virtually identical for all intensive purposes to the last one. Um, what the magic is that you haven't seen is uh, the fact that it was be has been made in basically uh, 22 days, which is just incredible. Refreschini is the guys in Italy who made it for us and they've made a lot of our uh, appendages and rudders and dagger boards and the like. Spent the last 10 days at his shop and everybody in the whole uh, yard is uh, on fire 23 and a half hours a day. Uh, there's TV screens everywhere, every three hours everybody's looking for the update, you know. <laughs> who's doing what during this leg, it was, uh, it was very good. What we have to do now is bolt this up and then weigh the bulb and fin together and then uh, make sure it's the exact same weight as the fin and bulb uh, weight of the, uh, the old fin. This doesn't change our performance whatsoever and we're going to start from here to go to India without any more point penalty. That's the goal right now. At Delta Lloyd, the concern is more about the accident-prone crew than the boat, which lost a jumper during a jibe in leg one. Well, I think it would make a good trophy, you know. Jackass yeah. Award. Eighth, eighth place gets that trophy. Eh? There you go. <laughs> I think, you, I think you're in the running for the trophy. Really. The boat's seventh yeah, yeah. place finish is not good enough for team boss and outgoing skipper Jer O'Rourke, whose business commitments prevent him from sailing leg two. Bottom line is, if there's no improvement, uh, there'll be further changes. Uh, it's not, uh, we honestly believe the boat has got the legs. It's not the boat, it, it is crew. This boat can win a leg. 
and it, and it will before before I finished. A Delta Lloyd, the jumper is not the only item about to be replaced. into Cape Town at the end of leg one. The crew of Dutch-Irish entry Delta Lloyd will not all be on board for the second leg to coach in. Unhappy with the performance of his crew, team boss Jer O'Rourke has brought in three new faces to rejuvenate his campaign, including new skipper Roberto Bermudez de Castro. The Spaniard has participated in three previous races, most recently on Torben Grail's Brazil 1 in 2005 where he sailed with current Delta Lloyd watch captain, Stu Wilson. This, this is a sailor, sir. Ah, uh, this is a sailor. Yeah, sailor, 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 D. It's the, yes. the girl with the picture up at the airport. Uh, okay. Also uh, joining the crew, direct Bruce. from the Alinghi America's Cup campaign, is Peter Van Niekerk. It's a young team, it's a, it's a new team, and yeah, for sure it's, it's probably the way to go to get a, a few more, a little bit more experienced guys maybe on the boat. And, I think it's a logical, logical step. Yeah, Joe Rourke, how are you doing? Hi, Joe, how are you? Welcome. With uh, Australian Morgan White also up. taking over at the bow, the Team Delta oh, Lloyd management has made its goals yeah, clear. No longer just to complete legs, but to win them. It's only in Cape Town that Leg 1 winners Ericsson 4 have been able to put much clear water between their boat and the one that chased them so hard and for so long, Puma's Il Mostro. Although both emerged from the South Atlantic comparatively unscathed, theirs was an epic and enduring battle. We know what they're going through, they know what we're going through. It was a slugfest for essentially three weeks of the most intense sailing. Not until the heavier conditions towards the end of the leg did Ken Reed's crew finally lose touch with Ericsson Ford, having begun their ocean-going match race as they left the Mediterranean. All of a sudden we see Ericsson Four right in front of us and we just ground him down. Next thing you know, we had a 10-mile lead and it's like, we can compete. Every watch, you know, you're three, 4,000 miles into it and you still have the hand-bearing compass going. They got two degrees on us, and we'd get two degrees back. How many miles have we sailed to get away from them? And they finally jive. Good riddance. Go away. Go away. How many miles is it to Fernando? And we we go through there looking at Ericsson. You know, they crossed tacks with us. They were like, God damn it. It's the red boat again. You know, it's just like, oh, that red boat, just go away. The test pushed both crews to the limits of their endurance and expertise, and sometimes beyond. One watch, we had, I think we had lost three skeds in a row to Ericsson 4. And Sidney went up and on his watch, and he grabbed the wheel, and I could see in his eyes, he had this fireman's helmet on, and the, the flap down, and his eyes were about this big around, and, his, and his, his knuckles were white, and he was gripping it. And he was not going to lose another sked to those guys. And Kenny said, Look, Sydney is on rails. He said, but we're going to break the boat. This is too insane. I mean, we are going to blow this boat apart. He's down below. And the noise, the slamming, you know, it's just, it was insane. And I'm sitting there going, we're going fast. I mean, we are smoking. Like, listen, just if things feel a little edgy right now, just tell them just a little throttle back. And he said, yeah, OK, I got it. I was like, I got it, Cap, I got it. So I put my gear on, went up on deck, went over to Sid and I go, you're kicking ass, keep it up. <laughs> Kenny, Kenny said, did you tell him to slow down? I go, oh, at least I got great respect amongst the crew. You know, they do exactly what I say. <laughs> he was like, you, you're such a friggin' idiot. And I say, you were the first one. You hired me, you jackass. What does that say about you? Puma's rivalry with Ericsson, it seems, is no less intense once they've reached the dock. Butter, talk, take him out. Hit the Ericsson 3 right now. Just take him out. Here we go, we're coming towards you. <laughs> 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 
The race now is who can improve the fastest. We have a long way to go. I mean, they're going to get better too. So we can't uh, kid ourselves that only we are going to improve. Everybody's going to improve. It's how do you take the knowledge of what you learned in this last leg and make those incremental steps. And your incremental steps, if theirs are this big, you got to make sure yours are that big. To go that next step where you're going a knot faster, you are on the edge, just hanging on for dear life. Myself, I went from the nav station through the bulkhead area and into the galley, clean shot. It was a quick 22 days. The transatlantic with the pirates, that was the benchmark for insanity. And this has just gone up another, you know, and I have a feeling it's not over yet. While work continues on the Telefonica boat, their crews take restorative measures of their own with a visit up country to South Africa's wine growing heartland. We've arranged to do some wine testing today. So we're um, going out towards Stellenbosch and we'll sample some of the local wines and then uh, I think we've also got chocolate and cheese. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm trying to put on the seven kilograms that I lost. For Telefonica Black's bowman, Michael Pamenter, the Cape Town stopover is a homecoming. Before we do the testing, I'm going to take you guys into a larger distillation area, and then we're going to move on to a brandy coffee and chocolate testing afterwards. Born and bred in South Africa, the 25-year-old left a year ago to pursue his dream of becoming a professional sailor. I knew I had to leave to go overseas if I wanted to carry on sailing. At that stage, I've just finished my degree, and the rule I had with my dad was, you know, you do your degree and then you can go and do what you want. So I finished my degree and I was on a boat straight away. That's the first one. <laughs> <laughs> a chance meeting with Bauer Becking opened the door for Pat, along with the one sailor under 30 rule that applies to every boat. I was kind of eyeing out the next Volvo because I'll still be under 30 for the next one, so I was kind of eyeing out the next one as my, my first opportunity, but I'm very thrilled to be here now. I remember with my brother also does a lot of sailing, and the two of us used to be at home watching the old. Volvo and Woodbread days and watching the footage and never think in a million years that you'd ever be here doing it. I mean, it's still just surreal at the moment, you know. Pinch myself every once in a while. What do you think about flying fish? I got attacked by one last night. Very, very happy with what I'm doing right now. Thanks. My mom keeps asking me if or my dad too, if I want to come home and get a banking job and I ask them why. Way more fun. Cape Town stopover is nearly at an end. Leg two about to begin. For the first time ever, the fleet will round the Cape of Good Hope, head east and then north through the Indian Ocean to Cochin on the southwest Indian coast. In racing terms, leg two represents the unknown. We're about to start the next race, going to India. Nobody's ever raced there before. This is clearly a leg where all bets are off. I'm pretty scared about the separation we might get between boats if we have a 400, 200 miles apart. I'm really worried that you know, you know, something happens and they win, or we can look really stupid. Leg two presents other issues, not so much connected with the fleet's sailing strategy as its very security. Piracy is this bloke turning up on your boat and stealing stuff, and it's terrifying. After the spate of recent attacks off Somalia, in the vicinity of but not on the Leg 2 route, the risk of piracy is being taken very seriously. The Somalis are very, very good indeed at hijack for ransom. So if a Somali gets on your boat, um, they are not interested in um, removing all the crew's possessions because they've got three months to do that. What they will do is hold a gun to the uh, captain or watch captain's head and say, drive to Somalia. You drive to Somalia, anchor the, uh, the boat, and then the, the, the negotiations start. Depending on their motivation will depend on who they target. So Somalis will look for high net worth individuals. Unfortunately, from your perspective, you look like high net worth individuals. I was lucky enough to go on uh, one of the boats yesterday. From the outside, um, uh, having never stepped on board um, a racing boat in my life, um, it looked like it was crammed full of goodies. And you get inside and it's crammed full of absolutely nothing. Um, and uh, imagine the disappointment on their sad little faces when they get inside the, um, the hull to find that there is nothing to, um, to nick. So essentially, you look like a great target, 
the fact that you aren't is immaterial because you have to deal with it once they've, um, they've targeted you. Has anyone got any questions um, about the, 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 the brief or the intelligence? Sir? Obviously, we've sort of got brightly colored boats and look like a big target. Is there anything you can do to make, to sort of, in terms of identification, like for instance, do different nationality flags make a difference? Do they target some people over others? Or I'm thinking particularly in China, is being Chinese flag, for instance, yeah. <laughs> better than not? Or? They're not no. really fussed about the, the flag. It's, um, is this a soft target? Is it a husband and wife team? Can we get on board, nick everything, because um, they've, they've got all the cash that they own um, on board and their cash card, or are we faced with um, a bare boat and eight burly sailors? So, are we at risk that if we start giving cigarettes and water and dollar bills easily, the first boat goes through, and then just every boat that goes through afterwards just become a target? It's difficult because um, it's a bit like throwing um, bread to seagulls and it's a, the, the thing is that this is a matter of judgment. Now I'm not suggesting that the, the, the lead boat then sort of stitches up everyone else behind by <laughs> throwing dollar bills in the water. <laughs> Look that we've got money. It's a matter of um, having a layered approach and the first layer is um, avoid them. If you can't avoid them tell them to go away. If you can't tell them to go away um, uh, ignore them. If, you, if they won't be ignored then um, at the end of that process, which hopefully will have been um, 45 minutes, an hour, you then say, look, there's some water, there's some cigarettes, just go away. Um, but you're right, the, the, the problem is if people go um, through gaily throwing stuff over the back end, then they'll learn to associate um, <coughs> Volvo Ocean Race boats with um, back sheesh. I know on the last leg we didn't have one, one single pound on the back. Are you suggesting we actually carry money on this? On the yes, I am. Hopefully it's breezy when the pirates are starting to poke around because uh, they're going to have to have a really fast boat to, to track us down. A new leg, a new set of challenges. If leg two proves half as good as leg one, we're in for quite a ride. Times, but they're exciting times because we're still number one. Yeah.